morning, Bay Point. Welcome. If you want to stand and join us, we are going to just jump right into uh, some favorite Christmas songs. There are so many favorite Christmas songs among you all. I told you for your favorites, and we're going to fit them all in before Christmas. So uh, we're going to start today, and let's start with Joy to the World. that God's name is so amazing and powerful. And we're going to be thinking today about the name of Emmanuel, which is God with us. And if you think about what Jesus left behind to come here, it wasn't just that he died on the cross, which was horrible. But every second from when he left heaven was pretty much torture compared to what he was used to, right? I mean, he used to be in charge. Now he's a baby he used to be running things now other people are telling him what to do he used to be 
treated like a king, and now he's treated like a carpenter. I mean, his whole life was such an amazing gift that he would even consider doing that for us. So as we start with your name, just uh, really contemplate what he gave us when he came.
Amen. God's name be praised. This we believe. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever and ever. God bless you. Welcome to Bay Point. Greet your neighbor. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Okay, welcome again, and welcome to Bay Point. God bless you for being here, just being faithful and loving the Lord and your fellowship with one another. It's really encouraging. Just a few announcements, and then I've got a couple others who will come forth for uh, announcements. You'll see on the back of your bulletin weekly happenings and upcoming events, and uh, just be aware of that. Wednesday night, we're continuing our study through 2 Samuel 16, really exciting and uh, hear, what's going, hear what God did back in those days and in our lives as well. Uh, invite people to Bay Point. There's some forms back there right next to where Juanita is right, right now, but uh, also just some invitations. Have those available so you can invite people here during the Christmas season. We've got some other ways that we can be inviting our neighbors and friends to know our Lord, to get to know us at the church, but mostly, uh, yeah, to know Christ. And if you have a prayer request or a need, you know, to put this in the offering box when you come forward for your uh, weekly offering, and uh, we'd be able to pray, and many of those are listed also in your bulletin on the back uh, as far as prayer requests, which we'll be praying for in just a moment here, too. And one other thing I want to mention, just to highlight, uh, there's several booklets back here. They're uh, life help, lifeline type of things that you can have for yourself, or you can give that to someone else who's needing just some good, solid, biblical Council on a variety of issues. So, real help for real people, and that's where we live in this 
takes it from the scriptures, and you're going to be, helpful, be very helpful if you uh, pick one of those up and read it, and you can pass it on to someone else. Um, okay, well, we do have a couple other announcements, so Jerry's going to talk to us a little bit about an upcoming outreach to our neighborhood as well as to our whole community. Come on up, Jerry. Try it again there. Check? Yeah. Well, it's Christmas time again, and our annual food drive is coming up, and I have been neglected, inspected, directed, and selected to be the chair. I guess that's what I am, whatever sure. you want to call it, with uh, supervision. <laughs> from Pastor Randall. Uh, this is going to happen uh, December 10th and, and 17th. On the 10th, we distribute brochures around the neighborhood asking for donations, uh, dry goods, and uh, canned goods. And on the 17th, we'll be picking up those donations and taking them to a local food bank. Last year, it took two trucks, two pickups to do that. So this year, again, I'm going to use my pickup, and I'm officially volunteering Santa's sleigh, a.k.a. <laughs> somebody's pickup over there, Andrew. <laughs> um, so keep it in mind, it starts, was it mid-morning that we, we start? Yeah. I, I don't have an exact time yet. Uh, but there are, boy, there are a lot of needy people out there anymore, especially with... Uh, inflation and a lot of things going on and uh, just a personal observation we tend to assume everybody that's needy has done something to themselves self-inflicted alcohol or drugs that's not the case there are so many people that just can't catch a break and uh, it's Christmas so yeah 930 930 okay so mark down that Day. And if you can be here and volunteer, it's mostly just walk the neighborhood, pass out brochures the first time, pick up the food the second time. And uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jerry. Give us a heads up. Another outreach we have going on later on in the month will be a family night outreach on Wednesday the 21st. And uh, there's an insert in your bulletin about that, and you'll want to read over that so that we can help uh, reach out to our local daycares and nurseries and um, we'll have a tree set up in, in Ross Hall. It's all explained there in, in your bulletin there. The greatest gift is what we're calling it. My, uh, Wednesday, December 21st and the way that you can participate in helping families uh, make it uh, through and have something for their children and um, you'll be learning more about that so that we can introduce them to, to the Lord. Right now we need to have our Advent wreath readers and uh, light the advent candle for this morning then uh, Andrew you're gonna come on up and after after Albert and Jay come on up and lead us in some sharing Father and Son uh, team today. <laughs> first Sunday of Advent. On this first Sunday of Advent, we prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus' arrival as a gift to all humanity. Let's stir up in our hearts and homes a sense of anticipation. Over this ad Advent, we pray that hope would rise up in our spirits in a tangible a life-giving way. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. We put our hope 
than the one to come, the promised one who comes from God to bring good news of salvation. We hope in the one who will lead us to walk in the light of the Lord. We hope he will not let us live in the dark, but on high mountain of God. On this day we remember to hopefully look for the coming of Christ. Scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and verse 6 and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from time, from this time and forever. The zeal of the Lord our host will accomplish this. Then we have a prayer. We're going to read this prayer, but I'm going to ask the congregation, please stand. Let's say the Lord's Prayer. God's word is to be given preeminence, given first place. So we are going to say the Lord's Prayer. Father, you taught us in your word to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Gracious God, as the Advent season begins, we cry out to you. We come to you looking for hope. When everything else we rely on fails us, our hope is in you. When we do not understand what has happened, we hope in you. We can hope for better days because we trust you. We know you, and we know you are here with us no matter what we are facing. Some of us see only darkness this time of year. Some of us find life overwhelming. Some of us are filled with Advent joy. Wherever we find ourselves today, loving God, remind us that our hope is in you. Be with us on this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. May the grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father be with us all, now and forever. Amen. can stand and sing along. Okay.
Good morning. Uh, I'm reminded that we are all broken, broken vessels. As we come through those do doors in the back, we come in here and we sit down and we need help. We came to the hospital, the hospital of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can save us, the only one that can heal us. Lord, I thank you that we can enter your gates with thanksgiving, enter your courts with praise. Lord, let's always remember to praise you, Lord, to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in whatever circumstances we are in. For that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. So we just recovered from Thanksgiving and... Uh, well, some of us did, and um, it's time now to uh, to come to each other. Well, before I do that, I want to I want to have a little ad for Sunday, Saturday coming. It's the third th of December. It's the first Saturday in the month, which means you can come out and meet Bobby and and Jerry will be there, and Chris might be there. He may be. I don't know. Jay, all these good good folks come and learn and. Kelly might be there. I don't know. He comes once in a while. And then uh, we got cool runnings over there. He'll be there. And uh, so it's just a lot of fun because we are knit together. We're not all the same, but we're knit together with a common purpose, and that is to praise God and to glorify Him. Amen? Amen. So come and join us. Hey, we might even have the big dog over there come with us. Melvis. All right. So... I would like to ask a Thane to come forward and help me. Could you do that? All right, come on. Don't forget the men's breakfast. 9, 9 a.m. This is a Thane. I want you guys, I want to introduce you to him. He's a, he's a fine young man, and he likes to do whatever he can do to, to, to be a part of this church. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So he's volunteered today to, to be the runner. And uh, that means he's going to take to you in the pew this microphone and let you have an opportunity to give thanks, to share what you are thankful for. But first, I want to do mine first. Can I do that? Okay. I'm thankful for my wife and how she has given me three arrows to put in my quiver. You know what I'm talking about? You know what? Okay, okay. And um, she's given me three wonderful children and uh, a great family. And um, she's a pretty good cook, too. So would you, uh, would you raise your hand and, and help a thing to, to come and see you and just tell a little bit about what you're thankful for? Anybody? Oh, there's Mr. Cleveland. Can you go over here? First of all, I give thanks to God for sparing our lives that we can meet again and another month and thanking him and praising him for a wonderful Thanksgiving that we have passed last week. I think that everybody here, regardless of condition, could give thanks for one thing that we are alive and in God's hand. I want to give God thanks for my wife. Regardless of what she's going through, day by day, God, you give her the strength to go along. Sometimes I wonder what is going to be. And for myself, oh God, is only who experience this kind of sickness that I'm going through will understand. I only go by the grace of God. And which I am thankful that he never leave us nor forsake us. I also thank God that I could have a church. And I know that everybody will that be the same. Some will be praying for the brothers and the sister, which I may be uh, include. But I thank God for the church, and I pray that he'll continue to bless us 
and keep us as we go each day. Thank you all. I'm thankful today that my husband could be here, sitting here. He could be in the hospital um, and not be here or in the grave somewhere. Dear Father, I give you thanks and praise for everything that you have done for me in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Bless thy holy name. Amen. I'm Gloria, and I'd like to give God thanks for another day in my life, because again, I have to say, I never thought I'd live to see this day in my life, so many years. So I want to thank God for all he has done for me, and thank him most of all for his son that helped me to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to thank the church for Brother David. Because of David, I was able to have Christmas dinner because my stove could not work. And I tell him about it. And he came and he fixed it and it is still going. Thank God for David. I thank God for being here today, truly, because you never miss something, or you never want something and miss something until you lose it. And when I had a little accident trying to put some gas in my car, I ran into the pump. <laughs> and I thank God it wasn't worth, uh, it, was, it was great, but uh, I tell you, trying to get around without a car is, is devastating. But the thing I thank God for is the family I have and the church family I have. No matter where I go, I see somebody, and somebody saying, come on, drive, come on, ride, come on. Yeah, oh, my goodness, I just thank praise God, because uh, sometimes you can be out stranded and don't see nobody. But God knows how to work these things for both my families. And I tell you, both my families are taking care of me, looking out for me and everything. But I tell them, I say, well, I'm trying to get the schedule down. And my brother said, no, 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 come here, come here, come here. Your sister's in the hospital, and I'm taking you now. <laughs> so, and then, you know, then we have people in the church saying, no, 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 I want to take you to church now. I'm like, I'm trying to get this schedule down. But, you know, I just thank praise God. Because, see, the schedule on the buses are no, not like they used to be. I'm used to paper, but they want you to put it on the phone, and you can text and all that. I'm like, I don't want it on my phone. So I just thank praise God for being here, and I thank God for you all. But truly, you are my family, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I see that uh, I've been replaced by someone younger and more spry. Uh, <laughs> you're doing a great job. Anyway, um, so I want to say that um, I, too, am thankful for... Uh, my church family, because uh, without you, I would have uh, lost faith in St. Petersburg by now. And um, I also want to say that I'm uh, thankful for the hand of Providence, because um, he, it has uh, protected me um, on my many bike rides. I haven't gotten slammed yet. And I've met some pretty interesting people. It's just that um, the good Lord left me to... Uh, for the connections, so to speak. Anyway, thank you. I just want to uh, thank the Lord that we have a God that never leaves us nor forsakes us. Uh, a pastor who preaches the word and his wife that supports him. And for a praying church, you don't know what prayer means until you go through cancer and you have this church that prays for you. And by the grace of God, I'm cured. Juanita's cured. Jean's cured. And Cynthia's going to be cured. So, and I just praise the Lord 
for all the prayers. Amen. Amen. I am thankful for Bay Point Christian. I have been a member here all the way back since Jay Cave was pastor. There'd never be another church for me. Bay Point has always been my church, and I love the guy that's standing up front giving the announcements. One day, that beard will be coming down. <laughs> But I love you all. Thanks so much. Thank you, my brother. Well, church, I just want to say um, something about my mom. She's, um, on a long run, which the church knows, brothers and sisters know my mom is, is doing good and I love her and I thank God for keeping her alive because she keep me alive. God keep me alive too, but I always look at my mom and tell her how much I love her. Honestly, I love my mom and she's on a 100 meter run and let's hope she can finish her journey. Thank you. Good morning again, and I pray and I'm so thankful for my beautiful wife, Lori, and our four-legged child, Lola, <laughs> and on a more serious note, um, so thankful and blessed with life itself. It's the greatest gift of all. And I'm so thankful for all the help I've had with my health and health care, especially cancer and diabetes. It's there, but it won't go away, but it's all being handled by the Lord. Uh, and I'm just thankful for, for all my blessings. And I just feel I've, I've been blessed and, and Things that we take for granted are really, really blessings, and I'm just so thankful for that, and thankful that my parents brought me to church before I was too young to even know where I was, and brought me into the faith. Thank you, Lord, and amen. Good morning, church. Um, I just want to thank God for moving in my life. I thank him for everything that he has done in my life. He's doing for me. And I know there's a lot he's still going to do for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for my church family. I thank you for the trials and tribulations that I have been through. It made me stronger. And it made me more powerful in my prayer and my prayer sessions to call upon God and to know that he always answer me in the right time. And I am thankful. I'm thankful for all of you in this church. When I moved here in 2000, I went everywhere looking for a church that suits me and how I pray and how I worship. I came to Bay Point Christian Church. Pastor Jay was here. And I joined the church then. And every Sunday, I used to be at church until my job decided I had was to work on weekends. But Pastor Jay used to come and look for me where I work every Sunday. And that was a big blessing. I also met Miss Elena here. She was volunteering and they had after school tutoring. And I remember 
Miss Elena and I used to come and we used to help with the students after school. So I really want to thank God for all that he have done for me and for knowing Bay Point Christian Church. Thank you. Give me a hand. All right, you can go sit down with Mama. Thank you, Lord, for life and life with a purpose. Not just life, but Lord, that we know you and we know you in our lives. It's good that we could share with each other today to let, to let everyone know where we are a little bit. We're all different paths, Lord, but you direct our steps, and we just thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you all very, very, very much. Wow, it's kind of like after Thanksgiving meal, after you've had a few seconds and thirds, you kind of feel full. I feel full already today. But uh, we do need to go into God's Word, and... Uh, Thanks for our tech booth and all that they do. Thank you for Marnie putting the worship together. Uh, thank you all for you know, setting the communion, for your prayers, all those kind of things. Really, really, we, we uh, Elizabeth and I thank you so much for your care and kindness to us. Um, we're going to get into the word wrapped for a very brief prayer, but uh, God's been good to us and watching over us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just once again uh, the privilege and joy of being able to go into your word and to be ministered to by your spirit. I pray, Father, uh, that it's nourishing and helpful to us, Lord, as you've already spoken to us through many here in the church, Father. May this be a season of time of reflection as well as vision and growth and outreach, Lord, to see many come to know you, Lord Jesus, to be part of your great commission to see you glorified in our own city, in our own world, uh, everywhere, Lord Jesus, that people would rise up, call you Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Are we ready to go with these? Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much. Uh, well, way back when, most of you remember the old story of Chicken Little. Remember Chicken Little? The sky is falling, the sky is falling, this little poultry that was running around the barnyard that felt an acorn hit his head, but he surmised that something terrible was happening. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. He goes around to the cow and the sheep and the pig and everyone else to try to warn them about what's going on. Well, in a very realistic way, that story is appropriate for our day and age as well. At least if you watch network news or if you tune into different uh, politicians or economists or whatever, they might want to replace the national motto of in God we trust with the sky is falling. They might want to do that because it seems like many are driven by fear and we tend to, when we're driven by fear, stuff our heads in the sand of shopping or sports or entertainment or anything other than the truth of God's word. A real look at the world as we go into this Christmas season can be frightening. We look and we see around us, and not to invade too much into our time of worship, but to be reminded that these things are reality where people are living day in and day out, including you and me. There's inflation, there's wars of aggression and crime and violence and sexual perversions they're just uh, shameful levels in corruption and government and business and media. There's a lot of chicken littles running around, aren't there? A lot of things going on and offering lots of doom and despair and not much hope. And even in the heart level, these things are just things you can see on your screen. But if you're able to pry inside and look in the heart, you would see other things that are just as difficult or even more so. Where people are dealing with hurts and abuses over the years. Just kind of a fire that just burns inside. Sometimes never even gets out into public. Guilt and pain and anger. Families that are torn up by dispute and divorce. Deep hurts and abuses that still really sting, don't they? You know what I'm talking about. So what do you do 
What do you hope for when it seems like the sky is falling, the sky is falling? What do you really want for this Christmas? Just more stuff? Or something more, something better, something deeper? Some healing on the inside and God's glory to go to the world to make a difference? Well, God offers you and me this Christmas something bigger. He offers us hope. We lit a candle of hope this morning and we'll continue to do that. And that hope that we have is not just kind of Pollyanna, oh, everything's just going to turn out fine. Kind of that wishful thinking that pervades so much of the optimism. We're not talking about that. We're talking about Jesus Christ as our hope because he is sovereign and he's Lord over all the relationships and all the events in 2022 going into 2023. And as long as he is king and he is savior and his Lord, we have hope. Amen? Amen. We have hope. He is our hope. So in the midst of all these troubling times that we have, we remember his ways and we bank on his promises and we see him as the focus of our, of our hope in every way. We're going to be looking today at the Old Testament prophet Malachi. This being the first Sunday of Advent, we often look at the hope, we look at the prophet, as we'll look at uh, in the candles to come. Today's text in the last book of the Old Testament, and if you want to turn in your Bible, if you would turn in your Bible, in your pew Bible, it's page 1019. 1019, and if you have your own Bible, so you follow along, take notes in your bulletin. We're going to look back at this Old Testament prophet Malachi. Page 1019, the last book of the Old Testament. The first verse of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 1, says this, An oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. That word Oracle can also be translated burden. Malachi had a burden that he carried because the Lord had filled him with his word and he had a burden for his people. He had a burden for the glory of the Lord. And this burden or this oracle that he was to deliver to the people was from God to give them hope. Now, if you haven't read the book of Malachi for a while, it's a book that is passionate for the ways of God and for the worship of God and for his honor as opposed to just kind of going through the, the motions, kind of mouthing the Christian God-like words, the religious stuff. That's not what God is all about. We grow cold to the things of God because when those things happen, when we're just kind of going through the motions, we're just saying the right things, our relationships are affected with our spouse, with our children, with our parents, with our friends, with our neighbors, in our church. We just kind of go through the motions and not really live and walk the talk. All kinds of bad things can happen. Now, Malachi wrote at the end of the prophetic Old Testament period. This was after, and we can get into the history at a later time, but this was after Jerusalem had been reestablished through Nehemiah and Ezra. The temple had been rebuilt, not nearly in the glory of Solomon's great temple, but it was still there. And the people were reforming again in this little tiny backwater province of the Persian Empire called Judah. Not much happened there. The big work was going on in other parts of the empire. But Judah was this tiny little backwater province. And the government there was led by the emperor of the Persian Empire. There was no questioning what he said. What he said goes. But God had something to say to his people, even in the midst of very, very difficult times. Now, this would be the last message that God would give through a prophet for 400 years. And the people would cry out in this book and in other books, How long, O Lord? How long? How long will you be silent? When will you send the promise that you made up to David? That there would be someone who would reign on the throne of God forever and ever from the line of David. When would the Messiah come? If there's a time for Messiah to come, we need him now. So people would cry out, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? But the Persians rose up, and the Persians were conquered. The Greeks rose up, 
and the Greeks were conquered. The Romans rose up, and the Romans also eventually were beaten down. But in the meantime, each of those people would beat down the Jewish people, the faithful people of the day. They would oppress them, exploit them, crush their hopes and dreams. It seems like the same way as it is for us today. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. We hear the bad news from the media elite and the government and the influencers on the internet and all that. But you know what? Without hope, we can't function. So God gives us hope even in desperate times. Even in difficult times, he gives us hope. He provides hope even in seemingly impossible situations. You remember God's word and his ways. Jump there on chapter 4 of Malachi. See chapter 4, verse 4? Just a couple pages over. And we're going to start there. We're going to go through chapter 4 a little bit in a little non-sequential way, but it's all there in one chapter. Starting in verse 4 of chapter 4, the book of Malachi, God says this to the prophet, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember. Specifically talking here about the Old Testament that God delivered to Moses, the first five books of the Bible, also called the... Torah. Remember God's word and his ways. Now, the purpose of the law was to reveal God's holy character. This is what God is like. He is a just God. He is a holy God. His standard is 100% perfection and purity. He can accept nothing less the purpose of the law also is, to, of course, to restrain evil and sin so that people can live together somewhat in a civil way. They would have worship before God in this form of sacrifice with certain animals that they could bring to atone for their sin, although only temporarily. And they would also know how to live with one another, to somewhat get along and have a means of dealing with disputes and things like that. But one thing to remember about the Old Testament law, even as it said here in chapter 4, verse 4, remember the law of my servant Moses, the rules, the commandments, the structure of the law was never a means of salvation. Never a means of salvation. Law-keeping, in other words, trying to be good, will never save you. Just trying to do good is never going to save your soul. Some people have the, the false idea that if I just do more good works than I do bad works, then God has to, has to accept me, right? That's the impossibility of it. Because you can't do so many good deeds because we have what is called a sin nature. We have a bent towards sin. It's impossible to do it. And the only one who has ever kept the whole law is Jesus. He was the only one who perfectly fulfilled God's law. As it says in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was teaching this in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus would be the fulfillment of the law to its fulfilled extent. He would fill full the law. Romans 10, 4, Paul writes this, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He did it all so that you don't have to try. In fact, the futility of trying to make yourself good and righteous before God has been struck down. Jesus says, your hope is not in fulfilling the law, but your hope is in me. He is our hope. By his perfect life and obedience and, innocent, and death on the cross, he bore our sin and so fulfilled the law. So what good is the law? Why does Malachi say this? Remember the law. 
of my servant Moses. What good is it then? Why would we want to do that? So that we could know God's ways, to know his heart for his people. And to share that as well, to spread that, to please him. In those hopeless and difficult moments that we're talking about, and even today in 2022, in those desperate times, we hold on to the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 16, I will delight in your statues. I will not forget your word. When you're going through difficult times, and Lord knows there's been those in this room that 2022 has not been a walk in the park. There's been suffering, there's been longing, there's been losses. But you hold on to the word of God during those times. Let me put it this way, kind of another way. So if you have a bad cold or a flu or a sickness or whatever it might be, what are the things that you try to surround yourself with? You try to surround yourself with fruits and vitamins and things of health and strength. You don't surround yourselves with ho-hos and Twinkies and oatmeal creams and chocolate chip cookies, do you? Well, maybe you do, but that's going to delay your recovery quite a bit. They're kind of cheap artificial suffering, uh, uh, substances, uh, substitutes. You know, that's how the world looks at it. Hey, we'll just stuff you full more of ho-hos and Twinkies and chocolate chip cookies, and that'll fill you up. But in the end, it leaves you empty. So we're going to fill you up with more sitcoms and sports. And we're going to fill you up with more in movies, entertainments, and reality shows and things like that. But when your heart is hurting and you don't know where to turn, you grab for God's word and it will be life for you. Take it in. Eat it. Strengthen yourself. And in your heart. But also in hopeless and difficult times, we bank on God's promise. Look up verse 5 of Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And you remember Elijah? Actually, when Malachi wrote this, Elijah had been gone. He didn't die, remember? Remember how he left? Chariot of fire. But when he left the earth, this was a thousand years after that. It's amazing there. But Elijah was a guy who, who prayed and fire came down to burn the, uh, burn the offering that he had set up for those at uh, the Baals and the Asherah. You remember that whole story there? And Elijah, this great prophet of God, was fed by ravens and given water in the brook. He confronted the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. He was hated, had a target on his back by Jezebel, the evil queen, and Ahab, the evil king. And of course, like you said, he was lifted out of this life on a chariot of fire. Now we have to remember that a prophet like Elijah is talked to about here, the role of the prophet is not just simply to foretell the future. We kind of think of him as a, uh, a fortune teller or something like that. No, that's not it at all. And a true Old Testament prophet's role was to foretell the truth of who God is, to speak for the truth and the coming judgment on sin and corruption and injustice, and to tear down those things that hold us back, and to give hope to the poor and the needy and the faithful believers. So God, according to verse 5, is going to send the spirit of Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. The Elijah would be a forerunner. He would be bringing news of something big. God's on the move, and God's going to do something. So he sends forth someone ahead to bring the message, to herald the message of a greatness that's going to happen. God is going to work village to village, town to town, city to city. Get ready, because this is what God is going to do. Here in Isaiah chapter 40, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level 
and the rough places a plain. For the glory of the Lord has been, has, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is an engineering feat of amazement. Raising up the low places, leveling down the high places, making things straight in the desert, and the uneven ground shall become level in the rough places of plain. Think about that. There's a lot of heavy construction material that has to happen there, right? A lot of engineering has to happen. And tradition, of course, says that Elijah would come before Messiah, making it clear for him. No obstructions, no difficulties. People can see Messiah coming and rejoice. The angel that appeared to Zechariah in the temple just before he was struck dead, uh, excuse me, dumb, before he, uh, because he didn't believe that this was going to happen, he said this to Zechariah in Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. People get ready. Ready in your hearts. As dark and as difficult and as dismal as the times are, God is sending one before you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11 through 14. Jesus even said this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violence, violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. The great forerunner, the great promise of God is going to come into human history and make all the difference in the lives of men and women and boys and girls and families and marriages and churches. This is it. Our hope, Jesus Messiah, whose promise is this one who comes into humanity, not on a great, huge, big white horse with flaming sword and shield and flowing robe, but rather as a tiny baby in a manger. And his cousin, in the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist came and announced that this was the one who would be the great joy and pleasure of God, even to die for our sins. Back into Malachi chapter 4, back up just a little bit and see what he promises. Look here in verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like cows from the stall. He's going to be the healer of your life. If you think of the wounds and the scars, some of the scabs that remain. And those are the things that you carry deep inside. Something that people never really see. But you know they're there because they hurt with many things when words are said to you or things were done to you. Or maybe you did them to other people. And self-inflicted, those wounds still hurt. And they can cripple you deep down so that you feel like inside, emotionally, you're not really whole. But Jesus, in his righteousness, brings healing. How many would love to experience the healing deep, deep down, even this Christmas? Amen. Praise God that he brings healing in his wings. And I love the way that this last part of the verse, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You ever see a little cow? You can't stop them. They've got tons of energy, tons of uh, spring in their step, their hooves, and, and, and hey, that's an excitement because, hey, I can also go out fully healed, knowing that God is the one who's the healer of my life. 
but also he's the vindicator of all wrongs. Look here in verse 3 of Malachi chapter 4. And you shall tread down the wicked, for, it, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Let me ask another question of you. You don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to. But who knows what it's like or feels like to be cheated or betrayed or hurt by someone, ripped off, lied to. Now, you may have done that to someone else. You know what it feels like coming your way, but you've probably done that to someone else sometime in your life. Jesus promises that he will right all wrongs. He will serve justice completely. You shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet when I act. At the cross of Jesus Christ, all the abuses, all the pains, all the vexations, all the hurts that people have fostered upon you, all the immoralities, all those things at the foot of the cross, Jesus took them all, and there will be a day of reckoning. Do not think that you will be standing in a sense of injustice for all of eternity. It will be dealt with completely forever. All sin will be accounted for, and the grace of God, the mercy of God, will save those who trust in him. Romans chapter 16, Paul wrote this to the little church that was struggling under deep persecution, being picked off one by one and family by family. How are we going to make it through another day? Think it's tough for us? What did Paul say? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's a promise. That's a promise we can hold on to. That isn't just willy-nilly, Pollyanna, I hope it happens. No, this is the promise of God. Praise God we have this truth that keeps us going, that keeps us going even through the difficult times, even death itself. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of, the, of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, staring death in the eye and saying, no more will you have power over me. No more. For even if we die, we know that he is the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You can bank on his promises. And then finally we see at the end of Malachi chapter 4 a great promise. A promise that has to be close to every mother and father in this room. Grandfather, grandmother. It says in verse 6, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the lamb with a decree of utter destruction. You think of the father heart of God for his only son. The greatest delight and joy and brilliance and affection that could ever be in the entire universe between the father and between the son. It was for the delight and joy and even the pleasure of the father to place on him our sin. How could he do that? Remember, Peter, James, and John were following Jesus up the mountain. And all of a sudden, there was a beautiful uh, radiance all surrounding Jesus, and he was transformed. It was called the Mount of Transfiguration. And they were beholding it with their bare eyes, seeing something that no one else had ever been able to see before. And God himself, the Father, spoke down, and he identified, this is my son. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And on Mount Calvary, God placed all of our sin on his beloved son because only as the son of God could he bear all that, and only as the son of man could he stand in our place as our representative. All of our sin, all the wrath of God on his son so that we would be restored as sons and daughters able to walk with God. 
So here at this very last chapter of the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, opening up 400 years of what seems silence, we have the great promise that fathers' hearts would be for their children again, and their children's hearts would be for their fathers. All that brokenness, all that dysfunction, all that pain and separation that many of you have experienced. God overcomes. God is the true Father. I think just kind of as a note of uh, uh, application here, there are so many fatherless children out there. And our prayer has to be, if nothing else, our prayers have to be in the reality, in the function of it, in our day and age right now, for the fathers to return to their children, the children to return to their fathers. God has a calling for the fathers of America, the fathers of this world, to be a father, to be a dad, to look to the Heavenly Father as the greatest example, and pray somehow that our church could be involved in that process. I really believe that is the true revival uh, that America needs. So what is your hope for this Christmas? Not just kind of a chicken little type of thing, running from place to place and then finally finding out, well, the sky really isn't falling. No, it's serious. It's difficult. There are reports of doom and terror and death every day, isn't there? But there is an answer. There is a confidence in the good, sovereign, wise God and his promises. He's provided his very son. He's provided his very best. How could he provide anything less for you? Thank you, Lord, as we come before your table. We're reminded of the great sacrifice, the father heart of God for his son. Thank you, O oh God, that we have a hope, a hope that goes beyond the next shopping trip or the next ball game and the next pay raise or whatever it might be. Lord, we're asking, and I do ask once again, there's many listed on our prayer requests, praying for healing and for strength. Thank you for the victories, but also we're praying for those that are still struggling with cancer and other diseases, Lord. Bring your healing, would you, Lord? Thank you for the healing that is in your, that is in your wings, the healing of deep, true righteousness. For, Lord, in the end, we stand before you not because we're... We're so good or so righteous in and of ourselves, Lord. We have sinned, but it is covered. Your mercy is greater. We come before your table, Lord, with great hope, this hope that you sent before us, hope whose name is Jesus, who ever lives, who makes my plea before the heavenly, holy Father. This one is righteous, for I have given my life for him for her. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, reminded that God sent before the Messiah, he sent a front runner, a forerunner, and he left behind for us a reminder, fills us with his Holy Spirit, and he reminds us in this sacrament that we have of Holy Communion, the Lord's table. He took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples so that us, many, many hundreds, even thousands of years later, would remember what Jesus Christ did. The holy human being who could stand, the only one who could stand in our place, was sent from the Father to bear our sins. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. He knew that the shedding of blood would only be through the veins of the perfect Son of God. That would be the only thing be acceptable because it was not tainted with sin. It was perfect. So Jesus left us with this reminder. Whenever you drink of it, whenever you eat of it, remember me. So remembering him, do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. You're welcome to come to the table for all who believe in Jesus Christ, who have received him by faith and faith alone. It's a wonderful work of grace that God does to change someone's heart 
And if that's your standing before God, saved, completely saved, not because of what I've done, but because of God's righteousness that he gave, then you can come forward. If you haven't done that, if you don't understand that, then I'd be happy to talk with you more, get some literature to you. We can talk outside or in the fellowship hall. But uh, this is the time to consecrate before the Lord. He's here. He's here with us. Christ is here at this time. You may come to the table if you've prepared your heart. You may come to the table, those who believe in Jesus Christ.